Hello and welcome to a new recording in our series um, on journalism and production studies. And today I'm really excited to be talking with none other than Professor Vicky Meyer. Vicky Meyer is an Associate Dean for Academic Initiatives and the Curriculum at Tulane University in New Orleans in the United States. And we know Vicky from many of her books that have set the agenda have benchmarked the field of production studies. Of course, the book Production Studies that she co-edited and the sequel, um, as well as her bound, groundbreaking work on below the line labor in television and film production. And most recently, her book Almost Hollywood, Nearly New Orleans on the lure of the local film economy. And with Vicky, I'm going to talk about production studies as a field, how it's evolving, where it's heading, um, the issues she faced in her work and what we can learn from that, how to balance doing research in a field that's both incredibly exciting and rewarding as well as exploitative and precarious. And uh, perhaps in conclusion, how what we learn from production helps us to articulate what good work in the media can or should perhaps even look like. Uh, sit back, relax, and uh, enjoy this interview. So hi, Vicky, how are you doing? I'm fine, Mark. Uh, good morning on my end. We're having a conversation about uh, production studies and what it is, what it could be, what it should be. Um, and all of this, of course, in the context of all your work in this area. And, and I want to kick us off about production studies um, as a field. Um, you said in the past that what production studies is for you is a way of, of capturing how power operates. I mean, we can all talk about the power of the media industry or on the big conglomerates or whatever, but for you, production studies is, is to show how that kind of power operates on a very local and particular level. Um, how can you, or how can we as production scholars show these kind of power levels, power inequalities, power hierarchies um, in the media industry through our kind of work that we do? Yeah, um, thank you for that question, because I think it, it um, it has to do a little bit with a very specific way of thinking about power. Um, I think, you know, journalists and documentarians were used to thinking about power in terms of, you know, organizational forms of power. So uh, there are hierarchies, you have a boss and that boss has another boss and uh, then there are interns and they have no power. And, you know, we're very structured to think about power in the way then in some ways the industry teaches us to think about power in terms of lines of authority. Um, but what I'm interested in are kind of um, maybe less visible forms of power, or maybe they're highly visible but not talked about. So things like social class, where you go to school is a, you know, a kind of imbues a certain power in, in organizations, um, race, um, uh, I, gender, right? That these these are other ways, right? Where you're from, right? Being um, in the Netherlands, I did a lot of work in Groningen, mm -hmm. and um, you know, it's amazing because working in Amsterdam then, and I was uh, had an appointment at Utrecht, and I would say, "What well, they said? Why are you working?" I oh, in Groningen, and they're like, "Oh," and I would say everything, right? That is mm -hmm. that is the way in which power operates culturally within organizations in some ways to say who has authority over what, in what situations, mm -hmm. and kind of unpack that in a very micro level in relation to these kind of larger cultural hierarchies. And, and how do these uh, very particular or local or very contextual investigations of 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 power and and all all their all its different manifestations as well. How does how does that relate back, or how do we make the link from those kind of power relationships back to an argument about how the overall media as an industry work? Well, as 
as you know, right, not everything is represented, not everything is distributed, mm. not everything is profitable. Right. So at the end of the day, the, the focus that media studies has had for decades on representation is an outgrowth of that um, yeah. ethnographic scene, if you will, that, that kind of practical everyday who, who can say what to whom with what effect, right? This is a, these are, you know, these kind of processes that have been only operationalized at the level of political economy or at the level of, of representation also involve this organizational sociological um, situation, right? Mm -hmm. For thinking about how, how, you know, why does it matter, right? Yeah, and 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 you you've in, in your work you you made a point at, at several instances that that as a production scholar as somebody who studies media production you can sort of make this work make these kind of connections by looking specifically at how media producers for example succeed in or at least try to sort of counteract uh, some of the limitations and constraints and power inequalities that they in, invariably experience in their work. Um, and could you give an example from your own work or from work that 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 we know about how you as a, as a, by by choosing a focus or a method or a way of looking at things as a production scholar you can you can find these kind of uh, uh, counter actions or res forms of resistance among media workers? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I frame it always so much as resistance as as making do so mm. how do people survive in right. the in the in the kinds of you know so so old marxist theory it was you know uh, theories of exploitation and i and i do believe that a lot you know work creative work in particular is about taking something you love and making it profitable, making a living off of it and, and organizations, whether they're public or private institutions are interested in channeling that, rationalizing it, um, promoting it, right? And making, mm -hmm. you know, con making, uh, making the institution go, whether through profit or through um, other, other power relation, you know, other forms of having power, trying to also, not to forget that that you know government and all these other institutions are um, using media and media producers, right? Right. Um, so it's 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 um, you know these you know there are strategies and there are tactics, mm -hmm. and I think that media workers are kind of tactically assessing, you know, how far can I recapture something that I love about this work? How, how far can I insert myself into this work? How far can I do something different, right? If the industry is so dedicated to building a continuous profit stream, they want, you know, more of the same with a little twist, right? What is this movie? Oh, well, it's the Titanic meets, you know, this reality show, right? It, it's always something um, known with a little twist. So for people working in the industry, you know, how far can they push that little twist without, you know, being again, a brand or a commodity, right? How do they kind of, how do they kind of preserve their own sense of self without being a sellout or, part of the system, right? That's mm. their kind of ways in which even putting yourself in gets subject to co-optation. Right. So that's, it's that dance that I'm interested in. And I think it's more tactical than a strategy. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. And I mean, one, one of the things that, that made me uh, smile in, 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 in a device that you sometimes give or lessons that you say you've learned from being a production scholar is that um, the higher up the food chain you get in media production, the less useful your interviews become. 
I thought that was just so funny because I mean we have a sort of a, 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 a sort of a built-in interest in the stars, right? And the director of the movie or the editor in chief of the newspaper or you know the the people with the bylines. And then you find out in your work, well, the higher up, the more they've internalized this sort of sort of this this PR rhetoric of the industry, and their answers are actually pointless, useless as, as for scholars. I thought that was a really yeah. I mean. It but it, it, it extends to the journalists themselves, right? There's certain routinized questions that if you're in the industry, you have to ask the auteur, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I find this with students when I'm having uh, industry people come in. We had um, Jack Sullivan, who owns Broadway Video, which, which owns uh, production. Um, they produce Saturday Night Live and Ginny Palin and all these, these big things. So he's a big executive. Mm -hmm. And I told the students, you can put your questions in the chat room, in part because I wanted to mediate this and I wanted to kind of have some authority to ask things that were relevant to the class. And the questions were so routinized. When did you realize that you were destined to this? Or what is the biggest piece of advice that you can give young people like myself? Or, you know, how, you know, what, what is some adversity you have faced and how have you overcome it, right? So all of these questions elicit kinds of performative hero story answers, right? Mm. I overcame it this way. Mm. And so even when you try to ask something like, what did you have for breakfast? It gets fit into these performative frames because that's what, that's what they do, right? So it's not, it's both um, human behavior and a way that the industry functions, which is the higher you go, the more performative you have to be. Hmm. Yeah. And do you think, just to remain on this point, just for very briefly, but, but the, the, this notion that, that the people, the more successful you become, the higher you, 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 you get in the, in the, in the ladder of, 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 of the media industry, is it that they are, I mean, is that selling out in a subtle way, not for money, but just for the industry, to like to, to, to normalize, to internalize how the industry works? Uh, and and be because on the other hand, uh, we also know from talking to media professionals that they can be quite critical or reflexive about their own industry and how it functions. So that there seems to be a tension there uh, in, in some way that, that they stop articulating once they get to the top or... Yeah, I think, um, I think it's different. I think John Caldwell talks about this. There are different mm -hmm. kinds of stages for different kinds of performances. Mm -hmm. So within an industry group, so you get a bunch of journalists together, and this is a great way to do production studies is, well, this doesn't work in COVID, but pre-COVID, you could just go to the bar where all right. the journalists hang out and they yes. all start talking about, you know, their, just the inane, inaneness of different kinds of things within their jobs, right? And you can find a lot of information there. Um, but, you know, higher up the food chain, you know, there, you're not, you don't have access to those stages, right? The personal right. stages. And what you do have access to, they've already performed for trade magazines or newspapers or other kinds of uh, PR opportunities, right? Um, I was gonna say something about working in the Dean's office in front stage, backstage, but I'll, I'll save that for another, another venue. Um, in in, in uh, some of your more recent work, you bring or um, production studies together with reception studies. And, and, and this seems particularly important for all kinds of reasons, but also very specifically about the ways in which, of course, the industry is sort of incorporating the creative work of consumers into there, whether it's marketing or, or user generated content or whatever your citizen journalism, or whatever you want to call it. But also, of course, how all of us are producing all kinds of media formally and informally in all kinds of different ways, including what we're doing right now. Um, and and, and in, in that argument, you make an interesting suggestion that, that, that um, 
production scholarships, you say, seems to be uh, picking up on, on something that is much more established, perhaps in, in audience and reception studies, is, is to start focusing more intensely on all kinds of marginalized or silenced voices and people. Uh, 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 minority groups, community media, indigenous media, for example. Um, where do you think this 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 sudden interest? Well, it's maybe not that sudden, but this 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 growing interest in these kind of groups and 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 communities and forms of media in production come from. I mean, why are we all all of a sudden care about that? Well, I mean, I think you kind of answered the one piece of the question, which is that it's always been going on, but it just wasn't the center for media studies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, studies of, it used to be called community media or alternative media. There's always been interest in groups of people producing media who are not um, mass media. And, and one of the problems though with that is that they were set up as kind of dichotomous, right? You know, you've got the big powerful media here and then you've got all these you know marginalized groups doing their own thing here mm -hmm. but what happens of course you know beginning in the 2000s really right the early aughts is um the the kind of uh, demotic shift right towards mm -hmm. reality tv and you know blogging and vlogging and you know make your own kinds of things and of course you know a lot of that you know was met in media studies with a lot of enthusiasm look at all these people look at all the great things they're doing and look at the you know let's celebrate um what they're doing and i think in reception studies there was some of that for sure like let's uh let's see what Star Trek fans and how resistant and, and uh, all the great things that they're making counter narratives to Star Trek. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in a particular strand of reception studies, which was, I often think of as really came from a feminist impulse. Um, it was mostly women who were studying marginalized groups and realizing that um, people were, were producing meanings that were um, not necessarily uh, totally counter to what was being produced, but, but gave it a different um, meaning in terms of every, people's everyday lives, right? So, you know, um, women who were watching soap operas weren't resisting the soap opera, but they were uh, loving on the antagonist in the soap opera in a way that reflected on their own personal domestic situation. And I think it's that contextualization of what people attach to their production and to their creations in the context of their daily lives mm -hmm. that, that makes it, um, that was something that to me was something I learned in graduate school and I wanted to bring to the study of production, yeah. right? It's not that this production is so resistant because of who does it, but how does that production fit into the context culturally and, and politically and economically in their own universe? I mean, that, that's, that's a great point. I mean, the, the, the incredibly, incredible significance of context for media production, right? That, that a newsroom in New York is not the same as a news, newsroom in New Orleans. And, and a documentary film project shot on location in Amsterdam is not the same as one in Siberia or whatever. Um, and this focus on place, and as you call it, place making, that media professionals do when they work at a specific locale, is an incredible important trope in your work. Um, um, does it have to do with your location specifically, with being in New Orleans and that very unique uh, community, or is it something more general that you would say, just for production scholars to be very aware of it and to include that in our analysis? Well, I think it's both, right? We choose the the research projects that are close to home in some ways, right? I think that that's always, always the case, right? And for me, the work on New Orleans, I actually resisted working on New Orleans for 
uh, many years when I lived here. And then suddenly we had this little rain event that flooded 80% of the city and that we spent the next decade building back from. And it became a little bit unavoidable. Um, after Hurricane Katrina, Hollywood made explicit that they, through media production, were going to revive and save the city. So with those kind of, of massive political economic promises, um, you know, it, 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 it became kind of in my face because in some ways then we were all recruited to be part of this saving complex that, that we had to attach to, to media production, right? And the kind of ways in which everyday people were being recruited to, to help save the city, right? Mm -hmm. um, be an extra. And yeah, you only make $100 for, you know, 20 hours of your day. Uh, and you're, you're, it's actually horrible work. But look at this contribution you're making to, right. to the larger political economy. And I think the lessons I learn always at the local level then do have this larger resonance. I mean, I, I imagine they do because people read it and say, say they, they relate to it at some level. But of course, it manifests itself differently. Um, you know, I, I, I'm always interested, uh, for example, I'm trying to think of a, a kind of a Dutch parallel, but, you know, it seems to me that, that um, you know, when people say that they, they are co-producing something with a, with a big Hollywood company, that that has meaning different than if you're working in, um, uh, oh, what is it called, Hilversum, mm. and you say, oh yeah, I'm doing something here, and that, that culturally that means something to people, right? right? The, the, the Hollywood uh, complex, that aura, means something right which is yeah. which people then attach themselves to they attach their identities to they attach their own sense of status to yeah um in in doing this kind of work as 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 production uh, scholars um one of the recurring themes in in that work and certainly an important theme in your work as well is this sort of um all the uh, an ultimate paradox right where on the one hand we can clearly establish the evidence for a si uh, for a system an indus industrial system that is exploitative that 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 isn't exactly providing uh, safe or secure working conditions for its creative uh, uh, talent and um and, and it, it sort of it, it 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 swallows up all this young talent and spits them right back out. I mean, it's 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 it's, but at the same time, we see people lining up to get in, sort of willing to 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 engage in this trade off um, between exploitation and just being part of a creative process. Um, one of your suggestions for us as production scholars to sort of work with this paradox is to make sure that in our research, we focus on both the pain and the pleasure of, of media work. Um, um, how, how can we do, adopt such a focus most effectively? Because in some, some, I mean, I know this from my own work, I sometimes become blinded by the enthusiasm of the people I interview because they're all so excited and are doing all this cool stuff. And then when I take a step back and I see the context within which they do all this work and I think, damn, how would anybody sign up for this? And then I, I sometimes get stuck. So how do you prevent yourself from getting stuck? Yeah, I mean, it goes both ways. Sometimes I pick out work that I think is horribly exploitative in my world and look for the pleasures. So that mm. was some work I did with um, a group of uh, young uh film school grads who would then get into this uh, soft core pornography. And, uh, you know, a lot of people were focusing on how exploited the women were. And I was wonder, wondering, God, it sounds awful for the men, right? Like, it just sounds like a, talk about a way of killing sexual pleasure than to go out and, you know, take pictures of girls and their boobs in public all day. It sounds horrible. Mm. And so for that, 
project, I had to spend all this time to kind of get over what I saw as horrible, right, <laughs> to begin with, and really try to understand, like, well, what's, what's the allure, right? What, you know, what did you think this was going to be? What is the, what, you know, once you find out it's awful, what do you, how do you stick with it, right? And, um, and, you know, in their case, it was, you know, when everything else was awful, they stuck in it for each other. They all became friends. It was this kind of, you know, male bonding community that they, they could capture there. Um, you know, because it's certainly that none of their parents wanted to know about this stuff. Um, so, so that's one part of it. And then there's the other side of it with the people who are, um, you know, not only, you know, realizing that kind of performative, right? How do people get their next gig in creative industries? It's oftentimes by, you know, emphasizing the most positive parts of the job, right? So talking about the pleasures, that, that comes easily, right? Because they're constantly performing that. They have to perform it to their job. They have to perform it to their team members. They have to, you know, there's always this kind of, you know, ways in which, you know, pleasure becomes central um and sometimes you can get at that at interviews uh we just did uh, me and my my co-collaborators conspirator uh we just interviewed 62 creative workers in the city about um their lives pre and post covid wow. um so we that's coming that is all being published on um, a magazine that I co-direct with with my co-conspirator called Via Nola V. Mm -hmm. But um, sometimes you can get that from the interview itself, right? If you know, like I've done this for ages and they say, oh, I'm, you know, I just, I love the, you know, seeing the, uh, seeing the, my, you know, baby documentary come out and it's so exciting. It's like, digging a little bit into that, like, um, well, where does it go from here, there? And how much money does that make? And what is your day job? And, you know, all of these kinds of things. Mm. Um, and so my, my interviews can, can get quite dark quite fast when you start asking these kind of questions about, you know, income, mm. uh, hours, right, being always on, never being able to say something, you know, like what would, what, what can't you say to an employer that you think, you know, these kind right. of things. Right. Um, but it also, but for me, the best way to kind of come to these, and that's why I'm kind of a dedicated field worker is just being around the same scene. Right. So it's one thing to um, be the intern and you know, be performing how the pleasures and, and everything good around you, but just staying in the office and realizing, oh, why is it that, that all the black people are doing all the secretarial work and all the white people are getting ahead or realizing like, oh, you know, I, I, I really can't talk about this, you know, um, you know, I, 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 wasn't a worker in these industries, but I often um, kind of became part of them right. in some ways. You know, I you know I volunteer a lot. I offer my labor as a as a way of kind of learning about theirs. Now, now that kind of position, um, it's like a very reflexive position about your own role as a production scholar in the process as you get quite close uh, with your with your object right by, by for example by volunteering or just meeting people for a drink which is also part of your data gathering process and 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 you advocate in 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 your publications That's my pleasures and, yeah exactly it's it's pain and pleasure right right there um you advocate <laughs> that that we that we should do more of this right that to 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 become and to stay very reflexive in the process um because I think you mentioned somewhere in an interview or in an essay uh, that it can, because if not, it can lead to all kinds of weird ways of becoming complicit with, with, with the, the, the process or, or what perhaps is, is problematic about the production process. Um, 
how, how can we stay reflexive about our own role as scholars, as students, when we engage with, with media professionals in this way? Like, like how can we both become their allies or, 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 or get access and get, get good, good data in that sense, but prevent ourselves from being sort of, um, yeah, becoming complicit with, with what's going on uh, in their line of work? I, I think complicity um, comes when you think you're telling the whole story, right? Mm. When, you, when you don't think that every view you have is partial and is situated. So if I had a, a, a blackboard right now, I'd draw a triangle. Every encounter with the human subject is the, uh, the story that the person tells about themselves. Mm -hmm. The perception I have of that person going into the interaction and their projection of me that they're then shaping their story to. Right. Right. And oftentimes there's a fourth thing, which is their projection of the self that they want to be perceived as. Right. right. Um, but that comes out of this uh, triangle. I didn't invent that. I think that was Judith Stacy in, in talking about um, feminist field work in the eighties. So I, mm -hmm. it's, um, I think just thinking about that, reflecting on those kind of different selves, um, that are kind of present in your, right? I always feel bad sometimes when, when I don't, when, you know, it, it, it's very hard in a researcher's practice to not take that interaction as universal and to mm -hmm. kind of step back and think like, okay, but they're presenting this to me, um, now quite older white lady, uh, from a university, that's actually the biggest thing. Like, how do I say this to a university researcher, mm. as opposed to, you know, what I say in a bar to somebody I met? Um, so that's that is the, and that's the attention I feel in my own work. Right, is not to overstep one interaction as being so universal to, right? I. I try to have as many interactions and as many voices as possible to get to that, uh, to get to that, that insight that I think I have. And sometimes the insight is never more than this is what the method allows me to see. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in conclusion, I, I, uh, I mean, we, 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 when we study, production. I mean, I, I, at least for me personally, I want to acknowledge that one of the reasons to do that is because it's so much fun, right? The, the people you meet are fun. There's a lot of energy going around. I mean, what they're making is often just amazing. There's amazing game they're working on. There's or this movie or this, this story that will, you know, topple a government or whatever. It's, it's exciting. It's great. Um, um, so there's this tremendous promise in, 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 in creative work, in, in media production. Um, at the same time, we know that a lot of media production and a lot of aspects of media work don't live up to that promise. Like when you get into the real world, it's not all that. How can media production really be all that it promises to be? What is required for it? To be like that is it as straightforward as well oh my every god that's such a normative project i know i don't know but but i, I think said i can't come on i what? you know i i you know there's this whole movement that everything has to be normative now and show the 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 right way that labor is supposed to be and the right way that mm -hmm. that um that leads to the perfect job i've always thought like you know, um, you know, I do this work, uh, you know, because it's, you know, it's, it's better than something else, right? But, <laughs> but I don't have a, an idealized version of 
what creative work should be to produce the best outcome. I mean, right. that's, that is, that's where policy comes in, right? If you're interested mm. in the political outcome of thinking about what's the, then you're interested in the normative, right? Uh, conditions to produce the, the best outcome. Um, but I guess I, I've always thought like, you know, uh, you know, maybe I'd rather be fishing, you know, but, you know, <laughs> it's a, you know, but it, you know, all work is going to, you know, involve uh, some form of, of disappointment, uh, unrealized uh, potential, uh, you know, otherwise we, we would all be, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't know. There was a, there was a, there is, a, uh, maybe it was an insight that I had early on, uh, that, uh, work was not always, I, maybe it was all these internships I do quite frankly, or working in restaurants, going to school or things like this, that, you know, you look for the pleasures that keep you drawing you to that work over other work, but that doesn't mean that all of it is going to be pleasurable, mm. right? Um, digging into these interviews I just did, you know, they love talking about their art, but try to talk to them about all the accounting they have to do and how do you file taxes and how mm. do you get you know, government support right now during COVID. And it's like, yeah, that's part of it too. These are all the conditions that have to be satisfied in order to have the, 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 the promise of potential, right? Right. The promise that you could have this thing. So I, I don't know. I don't, yeah, I think I come into I, this is like a longstanding, uh, you know, debate, I think, in the, in the field as to, you know, what's the, what's the goal of this? Right. And for me, I guess, you know, you and I come from journalistic backgrounds. So for me, it's telling better stories. Mm. You know, we, we have a, one set of stories about what it is to be a creative worker. And I think that my stories are not meant to make people sad and debunk them, but to give a different way of kind of looking at that creative worker. Thank you so much for your time and for being so generous and, 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 uh, and hope to see you in Amsterdam very, very soon. Yes, I, we hope to get back, uh, the, me and the family very, very soon. So thank you, Mark.